This is a homily for Christmas Day. The Gospel for the Mass during the day comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Although we have four Gospels, only two of the four evangelists give us an account of the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, what we call the infancy narratives. The scholarly consensus is that Mark wrote the first of the four Gospels, sometime before or around 70 AD. But Mark begins his Gospel with the adult ministry of Jesus. He tells us nothing about the birth or childhood of Jesus. His mother Mary is named only once, and Joseph is not mentioned at all. Matthew's Gospel was written sometime between 15 and 20 years after Mark, and Matthew gives us an infancy narrative in which Joseph is the primary character. Luke wrote his Gospel at about the same time as Matthew, so sometime in the 80s, and he also gives us an infancy narrative. However, Mary is the primary character in Luke's infancy narrative. As I mentioned last Sunday, the mood of these two infancy narratives is quite different. While Luke's infancy narrative is filled with joy, the mood of Matthew's infancy narrative is dark and threatening, dominated by King Herod and his plot to kill Jesus. John's Gospel was written at the end of the first century, and it begins not with an infancy narrative, but with a prologue. And our Gospel for Christmas Day is taken from the prologue. The infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, and the prologue of John's Gospel, function in much the same way as an overture. Just as a musical overture anticipates themes or ideas from the opera or oratorio, the infancy narratives and prologue do precisely that in the gospel. They sound notes that will resonate throughout the entire gospel. The overture has been called the symphony in miniature. And that, by way of analogy, is true of the infancy narratives and prologue. Let me take a literary example of an overture. Barbara Tuckman's Pulitzer Prize winning history of the outbreak of World War I is entitled The Guns of August. Tuckman's first chapter is entitled A Funeral. The funeral is that of the British monarch Edward VII who died in 1910, almost four years before the beginning of World War I. Edward's funeral was attended by nine kings. Tuckman writes of the funeral procession, So gorgeous was the spectacle on the May morning of 1910 when nine kings rode in the funeral of Edward VII of England that the crowd, waiting in hushed and black-clad awe, could not keep back gasps of admiration. Tuckman makes this observation. This was the greatest assemblage of royalty and rank ever gathered in one place, and, of its kind, the last. In Tuckman's book, this funeral functions symbolically as the death knell of the old Europe. And this is a theme that she develops throughout the book, the end of the old Europe. So Tuckman used a European funeral as the most appropriate overture for the story of a war in which millions died, dynasties fell, and monarchs were deposed. It heralded the death of the old Europe. In the words of Tuckman, the muffled tongue of Big Ben tolled nine by the clock as the cortege 
left the palace, but on history's clock it was sunset, and the sun of the old world was setting in a dying blaze of splendour, never to be seen again. So let's now turn to John's prologue, the overture to his gospel. The prologue gives us the key to the interpretation of the entire gospel. So let's look at a few of the key motifs that John introduces in today's gospel. Firstly, let's consider the opening words of John's gospel, in the beginning. John then talks about the Word. He tells us that the Word was the true light, and the Word became flesh. On this feast day of Christmas, we celebrate the Word becoming flesh. So let's consider the significance of those three words that begin the Gospel, in the beginning. John is, of course, writing in Greek, and the Greek text begins with just two words, En Ache. John has chosen to begin his gospel with the exact same two words that begin the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. The English translation begins with the words, In the beginning. And the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, known as the Septuagint, begins with, En Ache. By beginning the gospel with those two words, John is saying that if the first book of the Bible is about God's creation of the world, his gospel is about God's recreation of the world. So let's turn to the story of creation that we find in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void, and there was darkness over the deep. God said, Let there be. On day one, let there be light. On day two, let there be a dome to divide the waters in two. In other words, we now have waters above the firmament in the clouds above us, and we have the water of the great oceans. On day three, dry land and vegetation. On day four, the sun, moon and stars. On day five, water creatures and birds. And on day six, the creation of animals and finally the creation of man and woman. God created man in the image of himself. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. The creation of man and woman is the culmination of God's work as creator. But how did God create? God created through his word. Let there be. Three words in English, but in both the original Hebrew text and in the Greek text of the Septuagint, it is a single word. Yachi in the Hebrew and genetheto in the Greek, a single word. As Psalm 33 puts it, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. So in the beginning, creation comes about with a single word of command. Chiehi in the Hebrew, genetheto in the Greek. So we're quite right in saying, in the beginning was the word. And that, of course, is how John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The word in the Greek text that we translate as word is logos. Here John the Evangelist is following a Jewish tradition, personifying God's creative word, and in fact, identifying God's word as the Son of God who became human in the person of Jesus Christ. In the words of John's Gospel, the Word became flesh and lived among us. 
But the Greek text of John's Gospel makes a point here that our English translation doesn't pick up. The Greek verb that John uses, the verb translated here as lived, is eskenosen. That verb, skenoo, in the present tense, means to dwell in a tent. So a more literal translation of the text would read, The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. The Greek word for tent is skene. Jesus is the incarnation of the creative word of God and becomes one with us in our fragile, tent-like human existence. But the image of a tent also takes us back to the Exodus experience. John the Evangelist takes for granted that his readers know that he's alluding to the tent of meeting. Chapters 25 to 27 of the book of Exodus contain instructions about constructing the tent of meeting. It was to be the place where God dwelt among his people. The innermost sanctum of the tent of meeting was known as the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant rested in the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant contained the stone tablets Moses received from God on Mount Sinai. Listen to what happened once the tent of meeting had been finally erected. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Greek word translated here as tabernacle is skene, the word for tent. And notice that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Greek word used is doxa. This is the same word that John uses in the prologue, and the word became flesh, and lived in a tent among us, and we have seen his glory. John picks up the Old Testament sense of glory as the manifest presence of God. He's saying that this presence is now visible in Jesus. John's use of these key words, tent and glory, is his way of evoking the tent of meeting and thereby telling us who Jesus truly is. Jesus is the divine presence living among us. Now keep in mind that John is sounding notes in the prologue that will resonate throughout the gospel. To see how John develops this idea of Jesus being the divine presence among us, we need to go to his account of Jesus cleansing the temple. In John's Gospel, the cleansing of the temple occurs at the very beginning of the public ministry of Jesus, immediately following his account of the wedding feast at Cana. When Jesus enters the temple and finds people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting there, he makes a whip out of cords and begins to drive them all out of the temple. Take all this out of here, and stop turning my father's house into a market. Jesus is then challenged. What sign can you show us to justify what you have done? He replies, Destroy this sanctuary, and in three days I will raise it up. They're astounded at such an improbable claim. It has taken 46 years to build this sanctuary. Are you going to raise it up in three days? At this point, John the Evangelist intervenes to make sure that his readers have fully understood the implications of what Jesus has just said. But he was speaking about the sanctuary that was his body. In Judaism, the temple was the locus of God's presence on earth. 
John is saying that now Jesus himself is the locus of God's presence. Jesus is the true tent of meeting, the true temple. He is the Word made flesh, the place where the glory of God has chosen to dwell. Let's come back to the account of creation in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. We're told that there was darkness over the deep, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. John begins the prologue by telling us that in the beginning was the Word, and then he tells us that the Word was the true light that enlightens all people. The Word is a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower. But now John introduces a conflict between light and darkness that will run throughout the Gospel. He tells us, though the light has come into the world, people have shown that they prefer darkness to the light. In other words, God has created us free, and we are therefore free to choose to remain in the darkness, the symbol of human rejection, or to open our hearts to Jesus who is the light of the world. John takes up this theme in chapter 8. Chapter 7 to 9 are set against the backdrop of the Jewish feast of tabernacles, or Sukkot, as it's called in Hebrew. The Hebrew word Sukkot is often translated as booths, tabernacles, shelters, huts, or tents. The feast takes its name from the fact that during harvest time, Farmers took advantage of the warm summer nights to sleep out in the fields in temporary shelters or huts. In the course of time, this feast celebrating the harvest became associated with the exodus from Egypt. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verse 43, we read that the Israelites are to live in huts in memory of the huts in which the Lord made their ancestors live after the exodus from Egypt. You can see here people making temporary shelters in which they will live during the festival. One of the main symbols of tabernacles was light. Keep in mind that during the exodus God led his people by a pillar of cloud that became a pillar of fire by night. This was symbolized by the lighting of four great lampstands located in the temple, in the courtyard of the women. You can see here the top of the lampstand circled. The Mishnah describes the lighting of these lampstands at the close of the first day of the festival. And the Mishnah tells us that these lampstands produce so much light that there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that did not reflect the light. Against this backdrop, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So let's look quickly at two examples from John's Gospel, which reflect the victory of light over darkness. Firstly, the story of Nicodemus. We first meet Nicodemus in chapter 3. He's a learned Pharisee who comes to Jesus by night. He comes then out of darkness to the one who is light. He's been impressed by what Jesus has done. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform the signs that you do if God were not with him. Jesus replies, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born anothen. Now, I've left that final word in the Greek in which John wrote because it has two quite distinct meanings. The Greek adverb anothen can mean again or it can mean from above. Nicodemus takes the first meaning, that is, again, and raises the obvious question, 
How can anyone be born who is already old? Can anyone enter into the mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus, however, is using the word in the sense of from above, that is, from the heavenly realm of God. He's speaking of being begotten of God, as described in verses 12 and 13 of the prologue. Jesus says, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the Spirit is spirit. All of this is too much for Nicodemus. How can that be? he asks. Nicodemus then simply fades from the scene, and we don't meet him again until chapter 7. In chapter 7, the hostility of the chief priests and Pharisees is mounting against Jesus. They want him arrested. But Nicodemus bravely speaks out. Surely our Lord does not judge anyone without first giving that person a hearing and discovering what he's doing. His intervention is scorned. Are you a Galilean too? Search and you will see. A prophet does not arise in Galilee. So although Nicodemus hasn't declared that he's now a disciple of Jesus, he does publicly speak out on his behalf. Nicodemus makes a third and final appearance in the Gospel in chapter 19 following the crucifixion of Jesus. Along with Joseph of Arimathea, he courageously makes provision for the decent burial of Jesus' body, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. He ensures that Jesus receives a burial fit for a king. This exercise of bravery and love in full sight of everyone suggests that, along with Joseph, he has finally become a disciple. He has at last stepped out from the darkness into light. Perhaps we can draw inspiration from Nicodemus as we tentatively make our own journey from darkness into light. Let's now move to chapter 21 for another example of moving from darkness to light. The disciples have returned to Galilee. It's night time, and Simon Peter decides to go fishing. Six of the disciples join him. The disciples toil all night in the darkness, but they catch absolutely nothing. This is John's way of telling us that any venture undertaken in darkness will end in futility. Darkness in this context is a way of speaking about being alienated or cut off from God. At dawn, a figure appears on the shore of the lake. We know that it's Jesus, but the disciples fail to recognize him. This stranger standing by the shore in the early morning calls out to them, Throw out your nets to starboard and you'll find something. So the disciples lower their nets, and to their utter amazement, they catch a huge haul of fish. Apart from Jesus, their efforts are fruitless, like the branch cut off from the vine. Obedient to his command in the light of day, they experience success beyond all expectation. On this Christmas day, we celebrate the birth of of the Word made flesh, the one who has pitched his tent among us, the one who has come to lead us from darkness into light, the one who has come that we might have life and have it to the full.